Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bing Jin, and the presenter of this paper. And first of all, thank you for joining this section. And this is the paper that is joined with uh, Xiaodong and other co-authors. I think Xiaodong is in this uh, audience, so I will leave most of the uh, uh, difficult questions in the chat room to him. So in the next 10 to, uh, 5 to 10 minutes, I'm going to try my best to deliver the overview of this paper. So uh, you know that there are a large uh, observed uh, labor productivity gaps between the agricultural sector and non-agricultural sector in many developing countries. And in the literature, uh, this phenomenon is known as the agricultural productivity gap or APG for short. And given a large portion of the labor force in developing countries is employed in the, non, uh, in the agricultural sector, so it is important for us to understand the driving forces of the observed gaps in order to better understand uh, the income differences across country and to better able to uh, design the policies. So what accounts for the large observed agricultural productivity gap? There are two potential explanations in the literature. The first trend of literature argues that it's driven by the coexistence of the underlying sectoral productivity differences and a high migration cost uh, between the sectors. Well, another literature argues that we can observe a positive productivity gap even in the absence of the sectoral productivity uh, differences or uh, the migration cost. So in our paper, we try to uh, incorporate these two channels simultaneously in the same framework. And we are trying to separately identify the three factors that I mentioned above. So how large is the underlying uh, nominal labor productivity differences across the two sector? How large is the migration cost? And what is the relative importance of labor sorting in explaining the observed APG? So to answer these questions, we actually employed a unique large panel data set from China. And for the identification purpose, we are going to employ the policy experiments. And now let me first turn to the data. So the data we use in this paper is a so-called National Fixed Point Survey. It is a survey or an original based survey uh, that is conducted by the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture. So the survey kept track of the individuals and households across years. And in our data, we can actually observe more than 80,000 individuals from the 31 provinces in China over the period of 2000 to 2012. So the policy that we use in this paper is actually uh, the new rural pension scheme, uh, or NRPS for short. It is the first uh, rural plan in rural uh, this is the first uh, pension plan in rural China, which is uh, gradually rolled out across the country over the period 2009 to 2012. Mm -hmm. So when the NRPS is implemented, everyone age 16 or above are eligible to receive the cash transfers amounting to around 110 US dollar per year. So why would the uh, pension plan lower the migration cost in our setting? In the paper, we actually proposed two potential mechanisms. First of all, we show that uh, when the elderly receive the cash transfer, they are going to spend more on the medical services provided by the market and less dependent on the elder care provided by their children. And also because of the income effect, we find that this elderly actually reduce their labor supply in the agriculture setting and allocate more time to home production as well as uh, taking after uh, their grandchildren. So both of these channels actually in effect lower the migration costs of the younger household members. And more importantly, we argue that the cash transfer received by the elderly shouldn't affect the inability of the younger household members. And as a result, they shouldn't affect the potential earnings they can get from the two sectors. And for the estimation, we use uh, the triple differences strategy. The first two differences relies on this staggered implementation of the pension plan. And for the third difference, we actually compare the individuals living with an elderly age 16 or above versus those living without an elderly that are eligible for the pension benefits. Um, with the data and the policy experiments, we are going to adopt two empirical approaches. The first one is the reduced form analysis, which is less dependent on the functional form assumptions. I'm going to show you the estimates from different empirical models. More importantly, uh, we would like to give you an interpretation for each estimate. First of all, both OIS and fixed effects estimates are biased estimates for the underlying sectoral productivity differences. 
the IV estimate in our setting actually captures the average migration cost among the compliers and those are the workers whose my de uh, migration decision is altered by this pension plan. And we also show you the control function estimates. In theory, this estimate actually captures the average treatment effects. And in our setting, it is exactly the underlying productivity gap between the two sectors. We also adopt a, a structural approach and we are going to structurally estimate the key parameters in this ROI model. And the structural approach allows us to decompose the different driving forces of the observed APG. It also allows to conduct several uh, counterfactual experiments to evaluate the effects of different policies that aims at reducing the migration cost. And what I want to emphasize here is that we actually, uh, we actually get consistent estimates from both the reduced form approach as well as the structural approach. And here is the table that summarizes our main regression results. The first two columns show you the ORS and the FISIFA estimates. And they're statistically, uh, they're statistically similar, which is in a strong contrast with the existing literature. In the paper, we argue that the relative size of the ORS and FISIFA estimates is ambiguous. And it, they, uh, it actually hinges on the parameters that governs uh, the joint distribution of the two-dimensional ability. And in the third column, I show you the uh, first stage results. The triple difference estimates suggest that the NRPS actually induced more workers to migrate to the non-agriculture sector and the effects concentrate among the individuals living with an elderly age 60 or above. And in column five, I show you the IV estimates. And based on this number, we can find that actually the migration costs faced by the workers or the compliers in these settings amounts to 55% of their potential earnings in the non-agricultural sector. In column six, I conduct a horse race test by including the non-agricultural dummy as well as our instrument together in the same regression. And you can tell that once I conditional on the sector of employment, the instrument no longer have any significant effects on the outcome. And this provides some supportive evidence for, uh, for the exclusion restriction assumption. And the last column shows you the con control function estimates. As I mentioned earlier, theoretically, it captures the underlying sectoral productivity differences. And you can tell that it's smaller than our OLS estimates and it actually suggests the a positive selection bias embedded in the OLS estimation. And having established uh, the reduced form results, let's move on on our structural estimation. So we are going to extend model by uh, incorporating more heterogeneity in other dimensions. For example, we allow the workers to have different migration costs. We also introduce idiosyncratic shocks to their sectoral wages and etc. So for the identification, we are going to use the NRPS and other hookah policies as exogenous cost shifters to the migration cost. But this policy won't have any direct effect on the earnings. And then we are going to embed this ROI model to a general equilibrium model featured by multiple sectors, by three sectors, as well as non homothetic preferences. In the general equilibrium, uh, the nominal underlying productivity gap will change in different policy environments because the relative price of the agricultural goods will change uh, in response to different policy shocks. And here are our uh, structural estimated parameters. And I don't think I have time to go into details, but the main takeaway here is the numbers we get from structural estimations are largely consistent with the corresponding numbers we get from the reduced form regressions. And also consistent with our earlier findings, we find that NRPS actually reduced migration costs and the effect is particularly pronounced for the individuals living with an elderly age 60 or above. And also, as expected, uh, more liberal who call policies in the destination regions will help reduce the migration costs as well. And now, equipped with the structural parameters, we are in the position to conduct several counterfactual simulations to evaluate several actual and hypothetical policies. And for the time's sake, I'm going to focus on two uh, experiments and also only on the uh, general equilibrium outcomes. Let's first focus on the second line where we removed the pension plant in the year 2012. What we can observe is that the share of non-manufacturing sector employment declined by one percentage point. 
the relative pri the relative price of agricultural products decline, which drive up the underlying productivity gap between the two sectors, and also drive up the observed APG. And in the last column, uh, in the last row, we conduct the counterfactual experiments by assigning the Hu policy in the most liberal region in China to everyone. In this case, you can see that the share of non-agricultural employment increased by 3.5 percentage points. And both the underlying and observed APG jobs significantly. And so this finding actually suggests that there is uh, plenty of room for China to reduce uh, migration costs by, uh, by having more policy uh, reforms, like HUCO policy reforms. Okay, I think this is pretty much of my present presentation and any questions and comments are highly appreciated. Yeah, I'll ask one question for me, uh, Bingjing. <clears throat> so I, I find it, and I'm thinking of, of uh, Clement's uh, work, work a little bit as well, who's, who's here. Um, so it seems that uh, in, in a very basic sort of, one thing I'm trying to understand is how this interact with, with, with the HUCO policy, not in terms of counterfactual, but just in your very basic uh, initial uh, reduce from kind of estimates. And I thought it was interesting, personally, I thought it was interesting that you find that these fixed effects estimates already are a lot higher than others have found uh, um, in my own work, but also, you know, David Lagakas have confirmed it is a number, you know, at all in his uh, 2020 paper in a number of countries. Wouldn't that just, wouldn't we just exactly expect that, because in a fixed effect, you're just estimating out of movers. So you would expect that if there's any kind of constraints such as are there to the HUCO policy, uh, where in other contexts, that difference would already have been arbitraged away by, by the movers. Uh, in, in a setting like China, that's I think exactly the setting where you would not have expected that. You would expect that a basic fix of facts estimating out of movers would show up as something because there are less opportunity, like there are uh, inherent constraints to moving due to the hookah system. So you would expect there to be a residual difference. Is that kind of how you think of that as well in relation with the rest of the literature? Uh, I think this is exactly the answer why uh, the fixed effect estimates is in the same part as the well as estimate. That's exactly yeah. the intuition. So we can show you in a formal Roy model setting that the high migration cost is a necessary condition for the fixed effect estimates to be uh, in the same part as the OLS estimates, or sometimes it can be even higher than the OLS estimate. But one of the necessary conditions is that the migration cost needs to be high enough. Another as a necessary condition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, it depends on the parameters that governs the joint distribution of the agricultural ability as well as the non-agricultural ability. Can I just, just out of curiosity, in, in, as a follow up, the HUCO has been changing a lot over time. So I forgot about the timing exactly of, of, of your data. So, how does it interact with some of the very recent, I think, the 2015 changes to the policy? Uh, yes, in our data, we do find that the pool of uh, HUCO policies actually change a lot. Uh, our sample period spans from 2003 to 2012. So, during this period, yeah. But uh, for many of our empirical analysis, we focus on this rural pension plan. And this is another set of policy. And we argue that it can exogenously lower the migration costs faced by the younger members in the households. I guess, I guess we are, we're out of time. So uh, I was had some questions on the labor demand elasticity and, and those sort of how you calibrate those. Um, What's the empirical side of that? So what? Yeah, um, yes, I, I will email you later. So to discuss Great. about this. Thank you. Okay. Great paper. Really interesting. Thank you. So uh, and thanks. I will save all the uh, questions in the chat room, and uh, if possible, I will email you later. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>